Hello, my name is Dan Horner. Today I'm here with our videographer and creative genius, Tony Benici. Uh, we're at the beautiful home of Dougal McDonald, who has been a longtime member of the Sun Coast Woodcrafters Guild. Uh, today, Dougal is going to tell us all about wood carving. Now, Dougal, before we get started in your presentation, tell us how you got into wood carving in the beginning. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, where I got started, I think I think I was about um, 12 years old, and I had a I had a very interesting neighbor in southwestern Ontario. Uh, Jim Volbrecht is his name, and. Uh, he was always doing something interesting, so I was always over there. And it went, he, he handed me a magazine that had a um, about a three-page article on, on, on wood carving. I think it was a bobolink. It's a little, uh, say, five-inch long songbird uh, that's uh, native to southern Ontario. Uh, anyway, uh, it showed how to sort of cut it out on, on the bandsaw, which I didn't have, but... Uh, how to cut it out and shape it, and uh, and I, I I made one, and uh, it was surprised. It was I was surprised that it was satisfying, and I was surprised at the result. I was encouraged by the result. So I I, I think uh, ever since then, there's always been a pleasure of seeing something emerge from the wood. <laughs> it's in your head, but it's nice to see it emerge. And, and often, I'd say particularly with uh, with masks, as you as you carve, you will. Uh, the, 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 the mask, the person, I guess, behind it or the, or the whatever the spirit is behind the mask will start to almost exhibit itself and you'll sort of exact, know exactly what to do with the carving. So they, they take on their own personalities, all, as, as it all does. So I think that's my interest. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, why don't we go on inside your yeah. uh, shop and uh, let's get started with your presentation. Okay. Come on in, guys. Uh, Dougald, uh, tell us about uh, these different kinds of carvings you've done here on this table and, and uh, the different kinds of wood that you've used and how these particular carving techniques relate to your selection of wood. This is probably one of the simplest of all types of carving. It's called chip carving. And it can be done with um, a very few tools. And it's a very pretty... Uh, pretty thing to do. If you do decide to chip carve, <clears throat> the, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great way of, of getting to know the properties of the wood you're uh, intending to work with. This happens to be a piece of uh, Southeast Asian tropical hardwood, and I can't remember the name of it. It was, it was uh, uh, a favorite of pattern makers and was awfully hard to get. Here's another tropical hardwood that is, is just, just, just behaves wonderfully to carve. This is uh, Honduras mahogany. It comes from Central, Central and South America and uh, Cuba, too. Uh, there's, there's not much of it left. It's hardly highly uh, uh, desired, uh, but it's, it's great wood. It carves easily. It holds detail, and it, it doesn't break apart. These are some... I don't do much on the jigsaw, but these are some little... Uh, screens that are made from uh, Honduras mahogany. You can see how how much, how much it all holds together. These are not as fragile as they look. So it's great wood, it's great wood to carve. There are native uh, carvers use three species that I can tell. They, they would use yellow cedar, uh, red cedar, and, uh, and they would use alder. Uh, the alder was generally carved when it was, uh, when it was wet and they would have kept it in uh, in a damp environment during the time it was being carved, uh, it's much easier to carve when it's wet. It's, 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 it's quite difficult when it's dry. So that leaves yellow cedar, which um, I've found to be extremely variable. 
good yellow cedar. This is the lovely piece of yellow cedar. And if you're going to choose yellow cedar for carving, use try to find it without a really pronounced grain pattern in it, because usually the pronounced grain pattern indicates uh, a strong difference between the spring and the summer or the, or the wood the rest of the year around. And uh, you'll get hardness differences in that as you go, which they're hard to deal with when you're when you're cutting uh, with chisels and because your chisel chatters over them. Uh, they tend to produce weak joints, which is annoying if you're doing a fine feature and a piece flakes out. So a piece of yellow cedar that is relatively uniform in appearance as opposed to one with a, with a quite a pattern grain, the, the uniform one is the one to choose. This is great wood, it holds detail very well. And you can just see, I was trying, I was playing a little bit with uh, chip carving here, which is uh, with the yellow cedar, just to show how the detail holds. You see that, that ridge between the two cuts there? That will not happen, that will crumble with a lot of kinds of wood. The yellow cedar holds that detail well. So in great detail if possible. Certainly more detail than possible with red cedar. Okay, now, other types of wood. This happens to be, uh, this kind of gets into the kinds of carving that you might be interested in doing. This is architectural carving. These are, these are shelf brackets for want of a better uh, word. Uh, these are made from uh, white oak. Um, native to some, there's some in, in southern Ontario and Quebec, and, and of course in the United States. This is a lovely, tough, tough wood to carve, but it, it's a, it, it, it's, it's, it's great wood when you, you, you know, like I use, a, I, I hone my chisels to a long, fine edge because I'm using West Coast, uh, West Coast, uh, uh, woods, softwoods out here, but if you were going to use the same chisels on, on this wood, I would actually expect to break corners on the chisels. You have to sharpen them at a sharper angle. Play -Doh. Now, uh, other types of carving you can get into are, are architectural ornament. These are just little samples. These are done from yellow cedar. So you can see the yellow cedar holds detail very well. These are, these are, in, there was an awful lot of carving done um, in churches, uh, acanthus leaves, that sort of thing. Um, beautiful styles uh, and uh, English the English and European woodworking uh, decorative carving was really quite remar remarkable <clears throat> then you can kind of go on to other kinds of carving this is um, for this is the panel supposedly this would have been dogwoods but I, but I can't remember why I did that anyway that it's too dark for dogwoods uh, it, it's oak, uh, which has been uh, treated, I think, with uh, ammonia. Uh, you, uh, the, the, if you, white oak has got tannin in it, and if, I don't know chemically what tannin is, but it's, it's, in, it's in oak. Um, so that if you dampen the surface of, of white oak and put it in a, above a uh, container that has ammonia in it and um, it will turn this color it, uh, it's it's quite a, it's quite a lovely brown I, i've been impatient i just used household ammonia and i've just brushed it on and then washed it off seems to be okay you know then a more i suppose more carving in the in the kind of decorative carving uh, this is a slight uh, variation of chip carving where you can do panels, borders, that sort of things. Um, this is done also in this, uh, this extremely light Southeast Asian wood. Wish I could remember the name of that. Yeah. Wood that I like a lot. Um, probably 40 years ago, a friend that I used to play tennis with was, it was also a, uh, a log scaler, and he came back one day from um, a log scaling operation somewhere up the Fraser Canyon, I didn't know they did any, and uh, had a um, eight foot uh, log of uh, western white pine in it, and said, this is this has been dead, and it's been in our log sort, it's not saleable, would you like it? I said, I think so, and uh, this, this is, I've been carving out of it for 40 years. Uh, all the masks have been done like that, so, so let's, let's, let's just, see why this is interesting stuff. It's uh, 
Um, okay. Western, Western white pine uh, is not very common here because unfortunately there was a, a blister rust uh, that uh, got into the pine stands and, and uh, killed them. But let's just take an ordinary uh, woodworking chisel and, and you see with a certain, uh, with a fairly small amount of pressure that pine is, is moving very nicely. Lovely stuff. So you can, th this, is, this is nice to carve. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't finish particularly nicely. It has, um, and it's uh, got, it's, it's fibrous. It's, um, uh, it produces a, almost like a hair when you, uh, when you sand it, it's, it's just almost impossible to get a burnished surface on it. So, this is one of the reasons why I, I, I will choose to uh, use a, a chisel or a, or a knife finish because uh, you get all of these little facets that make the carving, the light goes off the carving a lot, a lot more differently. And you don't have to deal with all this fuzziness. It's annoying. Anyway. Okay, on to... Go back to this, uh, back to the, these styles of carving. This is, uh, uh, forgive me, I think that's, I'm going to guess this is also yellow cedar panel. This is probably glued up. So this is a, like, um, I, you'd call this a low relief carving. Th these details back here are chip carving for one of, yeah, chip carving. And uh, the rest of it is just uh, done with, done with chisels um painted with uh, acrylic paints uh some i may have had an airbrush um involved to get produce these gradations of the color it's not a it's not a tool that i love using but i it, it does things that other things can't do some people use it well i i don't love doing it and i'm not very good at it but some people do remarkable things with an airbrush here's a, here, here's, here's another one of these um, low relief um, panels. This one definitely has a airbrush work on it, yeah. So yellow cedar is an ideal wood for this, ideal. And it's nice to use local woods. Okay. Red cedar. Now, when you if you were to try, try to carve this with with red cedar, it is uh, it, it just won't hold the um, the details in the ridges nearly as well. You have to carve bolder patterns with red cedar. It's a bit more. It's a it's a bit coarser. Right. It's always wise to keep your medium in mind when you're making a design and not try to get too much detail and and end up breaking lots of detail out. It's, it's very easy to do, and I've done it a number of times. Uh, Dougal, why don't you tell us a little bit how you sharpen? Okay, thanks, Dan. Okay, when, you, when you're carving, you're always exerting a lot of pressure on, on, the, on the wood, so you want to have sharp tools, you know, as sharp as possible. And, and uh, it, it's nice to be able to have a system of sharpening quickly. This, this I'll tell you, is my, my system for sharpening tools while I'm carving. Okay. Well, sharpening is probably the most important thing you're going to do as a wood carver because it's really hard to push tools through hard wood. So what I would do, first of all, if I was going to establish a new edge on a chisel, not this is too delicate, but this is uh, um, with a chisel, I would, uh, well, let me get a chisel and I'll show exactly what I would do. So this chisel looks like it's been recently done. So I would, I would, I would sharpen the chisel just like that, you know, just like that, and I would come up with a with an edge on the chisel, which is, as you see, is quite scratched, and and this is the you can see the the pattern the wheel leaves on it. But then you go to this, which is an ordinary old 1725 RPM motor with the starter windings, whatever it is gone, it'll go this way or it'll go that way if I start it. So I charge this with uh, green buffing compound. Green indicates the 
abrasive size. As this seems to be suitable. I'm not an expert on it. It was recommended to me. And I would say, then I'll plug this in. Set that going. Take the chisel. Quickly. That's all you do. And I don't know whether you can see, but that, that top edge of that chisel is actually quite shiny. It's burnished. So it's producing an edge which is probably a bit wavy. It's probably serrated, but it's um, it's it's very sharp. Okay, now, let me understand this. We've got a nice sharp edge on this uh, carving tool. Now, can you give us a little demonstration of the chip carving? I uh, can try. Yeah. So I'm go I'm going to say take this little this triangle here. So you insert this chip carving knife. This is a special chip carving knife in and you put there okay here's the part that that the that the wood is going to break out if it will break out okay okay now i'm going to go down here okay let's see what you got here okay not not a perfect chip but there there there's a chip this is this is yellow cedar and you and you can see that the ridge between the uh, the two chips here has held up very, very nice and sharp. Uh, you wouldn't, that would not be possible with red cedar. It would be possible, however, with alder. Yeah, which I, I, I don't like carving, so I can't say much about it. Duke, why don't you tell us a few minutes about the type of chisels that you have for wood carving? Happy to, Dan. Here's, here's what I've accumulated over a lifetime. These are these are, uh, most of these are, the ones with the yellow handles are all file, P-F-E-I-L. I hope I'm saying that right. It's, uh, it's generally recognized as one of the best chisels available today. And they are truly nice steel to use. So these are, are good general purpose uh, chisels. Most of them are just a little bit big for small carving. The handles are a bit too long. So, but uh, I think almost anybody who will who carves will have will eventually end up buying these chisels. Now, if if you are just beginning carving and just wondering what to what to buy, I can show you the chisels. That, this is a, this is a fishtail gouge. And the, the reason that these are so particularly nice to carve with, I'm going to switch over to this piece of uh, white pine, western white pine, wonderful wood if you if you can find it. Okay, this is a uh, this is a fishtail gouge. You can see that you can see that you can kind of get into corners with it. It's very very handy. Very handy. If okay. You are looking to begin, you could you could do no worse than start with that chisel. Now, do you only sharpen the uh, outside? Uh, yes, this surface is of that? yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that. Yeah, very very nice uh, nice tools to have. Um, then you go on to the U gouges and and the veiners. Okay, uh, I've got it. I've got it. these are probably my favorite. Um, carving tools um this one here this is the one you tried you tried down this is a this is a um this is from lee valley it's uh, the the they 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 sell these things in a in a in a set in terms of the, typically with sets you'll use you'll love two of them you'll use the third one and the other two you'll never use so but anyway, this is a, this is a this is a, a a tool that I think that I would recommend that anyone buy. Uh, this is a also from Lee Valley, a, a chip carving knife. Moorsum seems to be the brand. It's a very nice knife. I find myself using it a lot for just general purpose uh, stuff. Very nice. Then you would kind of go on to the, let's put these things out of the way here. Go on to the, uh, the bent knife, which is one of the, 
most versatile woodworking carving tools there is. This one was made by um, a native guy on the on Vancouver Island. His name's Herb Rice, and uh, he's finished it. He's got a little bit of a eagle's head or something like that onto it and some leather on it. But um, the big advantage to these uh, bent knives is you can do most of the things you can with a straight knife, plus they, they almost act as if as an array of uh, gouges as well. So a, a great single purpose tool, these ones here. Okay, the, the, the native carvers, you'll often see them working like this. They'll, they'll, they'll work diagonal to the grain. And that's that's how they will they'll make big big curves and stuff like that. So this is this is this is very good tool. Again, this this will horrify those who uh, work with metal a lot because uh, I'm, I'm, this is real seat of your pants operation. This is O1 tool steel. Uh, I bought it on the internet. It was delivered. I think it was by Amazon. Yeah. This is uh, uh, about one sixteenth of an inch thick, and it looks like half an inch wide, which is very, very suitable for um, for almost all these bent knives. So you cut off. This arrives very, very soft. It's soft enough that you can take a, a dowel or a handle like that. I can take this 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 mallet with this plastic end on it and bend bend it around the dowel, just tapping it to any curve. It's that soft. So I'm, I'm shaping it um, on, uh, largely I think you, uh, chisels, I think that it just seems to work, but no, not chisels, files. Um, seems to work very easily with files. And then, they, then after that's filed the edges on both sides, then I'll tap it over the dowel, drill a couple holes back here, cut it off, and then it's ready for um, heat treating. I have a uh, oxygen propane torch. Uh, it's kind of an old thing, I... but it does get it gets this up hot enough. What I read is that you need to get steel up over something like 1160 degrees Fahrenheit. It will change in color from from a dull red to a sort of a to an orange at the at the transition point at that transition point, then you dump this into a, a container of oil because this is considered to be oil hardening steel. All of this is by eye, okay? So in the end, you arrive at a, a, a piece of, uh, of steel that um, will have, uh, it will be very, very hard. So it's useless um then you then then you have to temper it so what i do is i put it in in my my oven in my home oven at uh, 450 degrees fahrenheit i guess it is and uh, the the piece of hardened steel will turn in this bronze color I've read that if if it turns this bronze color, it's a it, it's at that point still a hard, quite brittle tool, and I thought that's just exactly what I want because I want to, I'm not going to pry a lot on it. I I want the edge to hold as long as I can because they're a nuisance to sharpen, right? So that's how I made these things, and then just uh, yeah, the, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. So so uh, this start off like this. Yeah, that's right. And these are these these are these are. The, yeah, they, they're, they're, quite, they're quite good. Yeah. And, and you can, the nice thing is you can make them any shape you want. I think this one here, I don't know why that's that shape. I, I do break them. Um, they're, they're a bit, they're, I haven't, I haven't got it worked out. The temper exactly worked out yet. But anyway, these are, these are all fine. I think that if I were to choose one shape that I would recommend, it might be that one. That would yeah. be the most versatile one, then. I think so. Yeah, okay. yeah. But you see, it's it's very much like the uh, like Herb Rice's one here. It's just a lot shorter um, because uh, if you're working on detail, you want to be a little closer. You want to be closer to your uh, what you're managing. This one, this one is just a little bit too far away, right? It's just uh, I can't I can't get my hands close enough to guide it well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, so these are these are these are these are great tools, and anybody who's interested in making them, you can see there's not a lot of magic in it. You know, this uh, you can you can get quite decent tools. Uh, what, what kind of wood is that, Dougal? This is Honduras mahogany. And then, uh, how did you get the uh, blade in there? Okay, this is this is kind of mortised out, exactly one and a half an inch to that depth there. Then, um, then I, uh, yeah, then then these are set in epoxy, and these are the, the drill hole size just happens to be uh, a, a size of a nail that I've got, right? So these are that's what they are. These are anchored in. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, this is a one of the few tools made by the Collins Tool Company. And this is an absolutely remarkable tool. These are these are spring clamps, right? So you you uh, you get two pieces of wood or something in position, you make that like that, and it sticks, it's, it grabs right on, and you can put it in um, almost, I'm hoping that I can do that with these fans. Oh, that's uh, nice. That's, that's a very handy tool for sure. Very, very handy, yeah. They call them hog rings, and if you uh, like, if you're making small, small picture frames, miters, things like that, these just hold it together. They're just wonderful. You have to be careful. It's easy to pinch yourself with these things. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, it's, it's the brand name is a Wee Cheer. It's a. I think it's a, an eighth horsepower motor. Goes two directions. This is forward. This is reverse. Power is generated, is transmitted down this cable. This is this inside. This is a kind of like a bicycle cable kind of affair. Um, and it's all, and then, then you have all of these burrs that you buy for it. These are available. I think these are, 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 are Typhoon brand burrs. These are available from Lee Valley and various other carving supply places. That's a coarse carbide burr, that one there. Very, very uh, good sorts of things. This this one is useful. This one is is useful. This is obviously another brand. This could be Cutsall. I'm not sure. It's not. It doesn't it doesn't tear the wood nearly as well. This is a useless bit. I I, uh, I bought it thinking it would be good for detail, but you get like keep. You have to remind yourself that the 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 cutting power of these depends on the 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 velocity of this one particular bit traveling on the surface feet per minute is everything you know so the bigger diameter a lot faster goes a lot faster this is a, a medium diameter uh, uh, by the you can see how quickly they work yeah, they, I mean, they, they take off wood really fast, but the drawback is you're breathing it. <laughs> I've got my hat on, my face mask and everything, but they're, they're very, very handy. Uh, Dougal, you've taken, us, you've taken us through some uh, techniques. Uh, you showed us some tools and how to sharpen them. Uh, so let's move on to how you would actually utilize these for a carving. Yeah, happy to do that. So we would uh, we would go through the process of carving a a fish uh, similar to this one. This is a uh, uh, a facsimile of a of a red snapper, which is found off our coast here. And it's uh, there. There are other members of this family that are very beautiful. These uh, these these rockfish. But unfortunately, it's hard to it's hard to see them. So what we what I've done here is I've got uh, I would gather first of all I would gather research photos of what I was going to do. Now, this is a a, a China rockfish, uh, a, a relative of this guy here, but they are, you can see how beautiful they are. Um, it's a it's a problem of painting, but if you like painting, this would be just a just a, a, a lovely project to do. So after you gathered your research materials, then I would make drawings. So in this case, I, I made uh, uh, some, some black and white prints. Got, got a, yeah, a rough idea of the, the size and shape of the fish. Then, then 
Then I would cut uh, a, a blank piece of, of wood. This is the body of the fish, okay? These are the fin insertion points, here, here, and along here. Is this some of that uh, western pine that you're talking about? This is, yeah, this is western, western white pine, yeah. This could be, this would be uh, very nice to do in, in yellow cedar. I just didn't happen to have a piece of that on hand at the moment, but very nice to do in yellow cedar. So then with these fin insertion points, you've got to have a place to sort of glue them in. So I mark where the fins go. Then I put in my rudder table. This is the, this is the, the, the block of wood that's been sort of the template. It's been sort of done on the bandsaw, one side only, okay? I've got a, I've got a router bit here. It removes a, a quarter inch wide groove, groove half inch deep as guided by that bearing, okay? So I'm running the, this in my router underneath that. It's cutting these grooves one quarter inch wide. So then I'm going to show you the wood I, I use here. These are pieces, again, cut from the uh, uh, western white pine. And I run them through the, the planer. They're a quarter inch thick. And you're going to then put your fin templates on, on this thing. So I'm, I'm making fin templates, you see. So I'm going to make the template. I'm going to put the orient, the template, in the same direction as that. I would, I, I use a, uh, a pinwheel. I, I, this, and if anybody's got a better way of doing this, I'd love to hear because this is not my favorite way. So anyway, this pinwheel will allow you to go, this is an old file folder. It's a reasonably stiff. It, it will make an impression on the wood such that you can pick it up and pencil it in below. Take that to the bandsaw, cut it, and you have, uh, you have made a, uh, a, a, a dorsal fin and uh, a dorsal fin and I guess the anal fin template. Okay. Okay, Google. Okay. How do we get from this to a fish body like that? Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's actually, first, the first thing to do is to, to, to draw a center line on this. And this is, this is the most important thing to do because you're trying to make these things bilaterally symmetrical, okay? Then the next thing I like to do is to sort of find exactly the position of the eyes, okay? Then I would probably, uh, again, try to find the position of the mouth and then finally the, 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 the gill cover. So if you've got all of these reference points on both sides, you pretty much know how to cut. Then, then um, the head, the head's, uh, the, I wish I could um, tell you that I was a, an authority on the head of China rockfish, but I'm not. I've never seen one in my life. And I'd love to see one, but they're not, they're not commonly seen. So from what I deduce from the pictures, anyway, the, uh, the eyeball sits into a fairly large orb, but the eyeball often protrudes quite a bit away from the, uh, from the head. The mouth comes in in a relatively rounded fashion like that. Again, you're, you're working with chisels and with a rotary tool to get this uh, roundedness all the way around. Define this, often I would use uh, uh, this, uh, this Vayner tool, this V tool. This, this will allow you to get up into this area here and carve away some of this area here. This is where the, the, the gills would sit in the fish, right right, behind, right in that area here. The markings here are quite individual for different species of rockfish. This is something I can't pick up from the picture, so this is largely conjecture. Well, it looks like what I see in the pictures, but it's not, uh, I wish, I, wish it could, I could verify it in some way or another. Okay, once you've got all that, then you've got a choice of how to finish your fish. At this point, the, the, I've rounded this all with a chisel. I like using, I like using this chisel very much. This was given to me by a, uh, one of my old neighbors, again, from, from Southern Ontario. He knew his, 
the, he was a fascinating man, Bert Keats. He he, uh, he actually had an or a pipe organ factory in Acton, Ontario, but he knew I was interested in this, and one day he gave me this uh, this uh, little set of chisels, and I still have them. Wonderful. They're uh, so they fit in the in the palm of my hand. I can go along. I can chisel away bits and pieces, and I like to work like like this with a chisel. Um, the uh, that goes in in uh, in like so. Okay, that's that's that fan. So this is all rough carved out. Then then you do the same thing for the the um, caudal fin, I guess that is. And then there's another one here for this fin here, like so. Yeah. Then these these ones go in here. These are the these are the pelvic fins. I think they're called. They they're when we when we emerged on the out on started crawling around on land. These 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 were the ones that became our legs, I guess. And uh, the only things missing here now are the uh, pectoral fins. And that one there is slightly different. So they will be inserted by glue and, and pin in that location, that present. They will, they, will, they will go in roughly that spot. So that allows you to get them angled out. That Yeah, see I'm carving this down, down there so that that will actually be angled out, yeah. So tell us about the, the finished surface here, Google. This is, uh, the finished surface is uh, just as it came from a, from a gouge. The fins here are probably sanded to a limited extent because I wanted, they're more of a smooth, they don't have scales, okay? So that's, uh, and uh, th this is all pretty much from the, from the tool. I like that texture because in my mind, it's more fish-like, really. Yeah. It, uh, it provides a lot of visual interest rather than just sanding it all down. To... It does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some things you want really smooth. I mean, you wouldn't want that finish on your Ferrari, right? But you would, it was a, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this is a different treatment. This is a, this is a painted scale finish on a, on a sanded piece. How did you accomplish that uh, scale? Uh, I wish I could remember. I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know. You know, they, it's, it's obviously hand painted to some extent there. Yeah, can't remember. Yeah, these, these are interesting. These are the, these are paints. Painting is another. It's just it's an entirely separate uh, and complex business about painting carvings. Uh, these are all basically done. With, these ones here are done with acrylics, artist oil or oil colors. These are. You know your standard golden acrylics. Uh, this one here was done with um, artist oil color. color. I think that's cadmium red uh, and uh, uh, a mixture of uh, a real turpentine and uh, some um, drying medium that uh, artists uh, use to dry their oils. And the idea with this is that because the um, the, the 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 wood has got so many planes on it. It's quite. It's quite. It pulls in the finish, so it pulls in this uh, this oil pigment mixture to a certain depth, and it becomes a little bit translucent. It's it's uh, it's quite nice. Uh, then I probably use spray on satin urethane. Uh, it looks great. Yeah. Uh, the thing I'm seeing too is, uh, you know, these these are very impressive looking, but you you aren't worried too much about them being perfectly symmetrical or uh you know it's 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 almost like it's perfectly imperfect uh, you don't have to obsess yeah. about <laughs> getting it exactly symmetrical or exactly right or and you know when you think about it you know our bodies and fish bodies are not perfectly symmetrical either yeah oh you're absolutely right i, I mean you can agonize about these things forever but i mean if you I mean, I only have to look at myself in the mirror and the way I have to adjust my glasses to realize one eye is a little different place than the other, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Okay, this is this is kind of a made-up fish. This is a. Uh, I had this lovely piece of um, cedar two by four, and you'll see that I've joined it. I've cut it apart on the chop saw. I've joined it, and, and so that then I a different angle so that I can carve it on the bandsaw, which is by the way a very indispensable tool for a carver. Uh, you'll see that there are joins there. There's a join here. There's a join here, and you'll see the uh, a spline put across that is, uh, to, to hold it. And you'll see another join there with a the spline. Then, with, uh, with this, this cedar, which is almost this color, actually, some of, the, some of the old cedar that's been deadened down for a long time is a brown-purple, and it's wonderful stuff. Harder and harder to find. But um, this is orange shellac. And that's all. Uh, this is a, a kind of a, a turquoise uh, color. And on top of it, there is a, um, pearlescent white on top of this. That's why it shines the way it does. You can buy uh, pearlescent, opalescent, interference colors, uh, pigments, all with acrylics. It, it's really hard not to appreciate your shop here and this beautiful post and beam work here. Now, you you did house building and renovations for a living, and I understand that you built this uh, whole house yourself, uh, it, and it's, it's beautiful. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. My, my, my wife, regrettably, she's passed away, but she and I decided that we would like to do this kind of house. Uh, we lived in Vancouver and we wanted to come over here to retire. And we liked this kind of house. So we, I, I looked at all of the research materials I could. I, we went to a conference in Oregon on Tim, uh, put on by the Timber Framers Guild and talked to some people. And I thought, well, probably, we can probably do this. So. We went ahead and started. Uh, Shirley was teaching, and I just took a year off and uh, came over here. Did this, put up the garage first, uh, cut all of the, the, the timbers, and uh, put this up first. And that seemed to be okay, so we went on to the uh, main house after that. And it's all, these, uh, this is all Douglas fir. It's all, it's all uh, Morris and Tanny construction. All pegged with uh, wooden 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 dowels put together. Well, let's go on, move inside the house, and we can see more of uh, what you've done with that in, in the, the building of it. And okay. You, you have some things in there that you'd like to show us, some carvings. Thank you. Go ahead. You need me. I'll follow you. Why don't you show us a few more of your uh, carvings that you have displayed in this lovely house? Okay. All right. Here's a few. Here's a few more carvings. Here's some. There's up there. There's some, some more fish carvings, which are, aside from probably being very dusty, are uh, fantasy fish. They're they're not intended to be anything. They're just kind of fun projects, fun to paint. Uh, there's another one of them up there, and uh, and I, I suppose recently I've become more interested in uh, in carving carving masks and people, which I've never done much of. These are examples of uh, of that. And this is this is the carving done by a uh, done out of a. a a polonia tree, what do they call it? It's a called an empress tree. It was actually growing back at the back of my yard and it uh, it got diseased, so I cut it down and I thought, I wonder what it would be like to carve. It's extremely light, light wood. Um, and it's got no particular, it's not, it's not nice to work with particularly. Well, I think, I think that the, uh, the Northwest Coast style of carving is one of the, well, the Northwest Coast art is just a tremendous gift to the world. It's, 
it's just hard not to be influenced by it. It's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful style. These ones here, that one there, um, it would be, it's hard to see anything Northwest Coast in that one at all. That one is not. These, these two here, maybe, uh, maybe, but uh, not so much. That one, that one there, I would say yes, uh, it, it has a Northwest Coast influence. But but it's, but it's interesting to uh, I know some of the some people uh, say that we don't have the right to um, do Northwest Coast art, and yet I think a lot of beginning carvers want to do Northwest Coast art because they they admire it so much. And uh, I'm often reminded of the, of the saying that uh, you know imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, and and I think when we when we do it, we carve it. We do it with with all respect and admiration for the uh, for the, that wonderful style. It's, no, it's not wrong to do it. It's just wrong to do it badly. You know, he says, <laughs> you know, there's so much bad work out there. So, I, I think uh, if you if you really want to do Northwest style carving, it's worthwhile making a bunch of studies to sort sort of understand the. Uh, the elements of the design, which are pretty fixed, mm -hmm. it's it, it's a pretty fixed code that you work with. Yeah. Well, and, we, we have a melding of cultures here. Yeah, and and so it's uh, it's almost impossible not to be influenced. I mean, that's been going on in the art world for yeah centuries. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I, I, and I think that we uh, we all borrow from each other, and we're all richer for it. You know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've always love everything to do with with art and uh, and yet it was, it's a very difficult thing to make a, a living from so I, I I made a living in other ways I, uh, and uh, you always bring this to whatever you do like if you're a designer and you're working on it you always you're always trying to make the, the prettiest design you can you can possibly make you know yeah, it's, it's, it's always good. Yeah, it's wonderful. This, by the way, is a, a frame uh, made that by that chip carving method I, I, I talked to you about. Yeah. Yeah. So, my painting. This is, this is a, good, a good example of it. This is what, uh, this is an acrylic uh, painting of a, of a forest scene. Yeah. That's nice. And I assume you made the frame too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, if you had, uh, and you know, maybe this is, maybe this is uh, applicable to your, your carving, your painting, uh, and all these other things that you've been involved in. Uh, it, it seems to me that, that one of your strengths is that you, you have not just uh, you've never hesitated to just jump in and try something. And it seems to me that that's kind of half the battle to, to learn to do any kind of uh, pursuit, uh, artistic pursuit. It absolutely is. I mean, you, there's, you learn by your mistakes and there's nothing truer. Um, if you hesitate or slow down to try to make it more perfect before you begin, you'll still make mistakes. So you know, might as well just jump in. To be here in your beautiful home and your uh, shop today. And on behalf of the Suncoast Woodcrafters Guild, I wanna really thank you for uh, doing this uh, demonstration and spending some time with us and sharing your shop and your home with us. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome, very welcome.